complaints about substantive issues like Gary was hinting at, and they managed to create structures and agreements that disadvantage um, their customers. Uh, many, many big companies say that they're about people, profit, and planet, but they're primarily about profit, right. which, which, which involves cutting costs and increasing, you know, dividends, etc. Yes. Um, and so the way that they work is, is once you understand how they work, it's a breeze to get an outcome. So they, they work very much like a king in a castle that's surrounded by a moat. And the moat is, in this example, is the call center. And the call center's job is to keep the revolting peasants at arm's length. <laughs> and they have four strategies. Um, and once you understand these strategies, um, you're home and home. Okay, what, what is the secret of your success then when, when you complain? Um, the secret, in a, in a nutshell, the secret of the success is to um, to push the conversation away from the original issue, and to push it towards the way that the issue was handled. Because if you have any sort of an issue with any sort of a big company that is even slightly unusual, nobody is authorized to act on it. They say they'll get back to you, and they don't. So they go into this endless vortex of failed promises. And, and weeks keep by, and they just make the system worse and worse themselves because they don't have the systems or the care built into the systems. The people in these companies are fine people. They're just hamstrung by awful, awful systems that uh, preclude the interests of the customers. Okay, so, so let me get this straight. You don't complain. Okay, so it's not the original issue. You raise the way your complaint is handled and make them act on that. Yeah, I could give you a concrete example. My flight was changed um, due to a scheduling difference um, a couple of weeks ago, and it took me um, an hour on the phone to get the airline company to pay for an alternative flight with an alternative company because it was moved from um, five, 6 o'clock on a Sunday evening to 11 o'clock in the morning, which wiped out my weekend. So the complaint I had was not about the flight change because they would say in the small print it says we can do this, etc. My complaint was about it took an hour before I could speak to a grown-up who would authorise the $198 <laughs> to get a, a, a flight that was more convenient for me. Um, and the, the, pro, the, the four things that the call centres use are language, process, time, and customer apathy. So the language that they use is a whole sequence of half-truths, like saying that they're not authorised. They, they use the word can't instead of won't. Um, you know, they say they're recruiting more people, but they neglect to mention the fact that they're losing them, you know, the hemorrhaging people because it's such an awful place to work. Sure. The process is insane as well. They say they're inbound inbo- inbo- calls only. They don't allow email addresses or phone calls. Any form of accountability that if you were in a restaurant would be just good practice. If something goes wrong with a meal, it would be resolved on the spot. But um, they set up all these systems and processes that preclude... Um, solution. So as soon as you get on to complaining about the complaint, um, they've got nowhere to hide, and that's when they have to pay, and that's when they have to escalate it. And it may well take a couple of weeks, but if you are persistent and everything is documented and, and recorded as it is because they value your call and they use it for training purposes, you'd hope, um, you, get to, you get to a happy place very, very soon. Okay. And, and it's the... Yep. No, that's good. I'm only cutting you off because yeah. um, we're running out of time. So complain. You're, you're a genius, Martin. You're a genius, Martin. <laughs> we want it. you on every day. Good you're on you, are a genius. Mate. Martin Hughes, the genius. Complain about the process after you've made your first complaint, which has resulted in no action. Very good. Lizzie Marvley, lovely to see you on the panel. Lovely to be here. Thank you, Jim. Come back again, please. I'd and love to. Gary McCormick, same applies to you always. Uh, thanks for your company, Gary. You're welcome. It was lovely to talk to you too, Lizzie. Thank you. That's yes, us. you too. Tonight on Checkpoint, storm damage, the cleanup, and how much of the cleanup is still to go. Plus, more high winds are on the way. The CTV building, families of people killed in it are calling on the government to review the decision not to prosecute engineers over the building's design. Hit and run, Attorney General David Parker has just announced a government inquiry will be held into Operation Burnham. Jonathan Coleman bids farewell to Parliament, the rights and wrongs of muzzling dogs and the Commonwealth Games and how they offer the relatively rare opportunity to lose to England and Malawi in the same week. All of that and more coming up.
RNZ News at five. Kia ora, good afternoon. Ko Katrina Bat in Aho. An inquiry is to be held into allegations a New Zealand led raid in Afghanistan in 2010 led to civilian deaths, including that of a three year old child. In their book, Hit and Run, Nikki Hager and John Stevenson claim the previous government tried to cover up the raid. National ruled out an inquiry when it was in power, but not long after taking office, the Labour-led government said it would consider whether one should be held. Announcing the inquiry a short time ago, the Attorney-General David Parker said he's reviewed a lot of material about the raid. The material I have seen does not conclusively answer some of the questions raised, and no amount of video evidence can. In light of that, and bearing in mind the need for the public to have confidence in the New Zealand Defence Force, I have decided in the public interest that an inquiry is warranted. The Attorney-General, David Parker. Families of people killed in the CTV building disaster in Christchurch are asking the government to review the police decision not to prosecute engineers over the building's design. 115 people died when the building collapsed in the February 2011 earthquake. Based on Crown Law advice, the police said last November there was not enough evidence to justify prosecution. But representatives of the families have this afternoon claimed the Deputy Solicitor General told them he was not aware of crucial information that could have enabled a prosecution. A spokesperson, Man El Casey, says the families have sent, have sent signed affidavits to the Prime Minister calling for a review of the decision not to prosecute. This is actually their chance to put, to put their own signature on this matter and show that justice can be actually achieved for such a very clear case, for a case that had been going on for more than seven years now. Man El Casey. Vector is warning more outages are possible in the wake of Auckland's big storm with another windy day forecast tomorrow. 129 lines are still down and 91,000 properties remain without power. Repair crews will be working through the night. Vector's network program delivery manager Minoru Fredrickson's says some remote areas may face another few nights in the dark. So at this stage we're, we're anticipating it's going to be in the order of two to three days. One of the things that could change that is that the forecast is kind of indicating that there's going to be some more wind sort of around Thursday. So that may result in more trees which have been kind of, I guess, damaged and um, you know, lost a bit of strength actually coming down as well. So we might get an increase of outages around Thursday as well. Minoru Fredrickson says crews are prioritising restoring power to critical infrastructure and things like cell phone towers and schools. Meanwhile, Auckland Emergency Management has defended its response to the storm. Its director, John Dragisevich, has hit back at criticism that not enough warnings were given or that management was slow to respond. I would suggest that the prediction was close, that the preparation uh, by the service companies, the Vector have been one, uh, council had every team out last night and, and further teams out today, uh, you know, I, I would certainly give it um, a good mark. John Dragusevich says there'll be a review of the emergency response, but that's standard procedure after such a storm. In Australia, the kitchen appliance giant Thermomix has been fined nearly $5 million for failing to report several cases of serious burns caused by its top-end blender. The action was brought by Australia's consumer watchdog after complaints flooded in about injuries caused by the TM31 model, which retails for more than $2,000. Under Australian consumer law, once a company learns that one of its products has killed or injured someone, it must report it to a government agency within 48 hours. Documents submitted to the court show Thermomix admitted it knew before issuing a public safety recall that nine women and one child had been burned by the appliance. Students at Auckland University fear thousands of books will be burned as a specialist library's close and a petition has been launched against the plan. The Architecture and Planning, Music and Dance and Fine Arts libraries are all tipped to be merged with the university's general library. A Masters in Fine Arts student at Elam, Catherine o Orkamp, says there's been no transparency or consultation. The people that have written the proposal don't have any understanding of how fine art students' research. So for them, the idea that it seems like a very easy solution to them of being able to move the collection into off-site, which is totally contradictory to how students research.
Catherine Orkamp. A staff member says that when the engineering library was closed a year ago, many important books were destroyed. It's five minutes past five. Sport and the Silver Ferns' hope of making the Commonwealth Games semi-finals hang in the balance, with Uganda an outside chance of pipping them for one of the top four places. New Zealand's 54-45 loss to England in their final pool play, uh, pool play match reduced Ferns captain Katrina Grant to tears. She believes Mar Maria Falau was left to shoulder too much of the shooting burden. Maria took on a massive burlow today, absolutely massive. Um, and Rhea's the type of player who will do anything for this team, and that's what she did. She took the workload, and she, she was outstanding. Um, but, yeah, we definitely have to support her more. Katrina Grant, Uganda must beat Scotland by 37 goals this evening if they're to edge out New Zealand. There has been some success for New Zealand today. Tasman Benny has become the first New Zealand woman to win a boxing medal at the Commonwealth Games when she came third in the 45 to 48 kilo division. AMI Stadium officials are making plans to boost capacity for the Warriors game there in June. Ticket sales for the game against Manly on June the 9th have skyrocketed, giving the Warriors unbeaten start to the NRL season. Organisers are hoping to increase the capacity from 17,500 to 22,500. Meanwhile, Roma have sent favourites Barcelona crashing out of football's Champions League with a sensational 3-0 win to reach the last four, while Liverpool are through to the semis with victory at Manchester City. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, Nick Tipping checks out the jazz of up-and-coming bass player Linda O. Oh. During Inside Out, and we present the zen of mulching with Paul McLaren, who heard us talking about weeds the other day and suggests turning them into mulch is often the best approach. He bought his first mulcher in 1986, and he's never looked back. And on Lately at 10, we feature words, pronunciation, etymology and linguistics. We'll also have an eye on books, music, people and politics, keeping you up to date with the world at the other end of the day and bringing you breaking news as it happens. That's Lately with Karen Hay on Nights with Brian Crump on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow for the North Island. Scattered rain or showers with hail and possible thunderstorms about coastal areas clearing tomorrow morning but returning during the afternoon or evening. Nelson and Marlborough excluding the Kaikoura coast fine today becoming cloudy tomorrow morning then scattered rain during the afternoon and evening. For Canterbury and the Kaikoura coast, showers, some heavy with hail and possible thunderstorms clearing overnight. However, scattered light rain from tomorrow or late tomorrow morning. Bullet 2 for Yordland fine today, rain spreading north tomorrow, briefly heavy, easing to isolated showers tomorrow evening. And for, the, for Southland and Otago, showers becoming isolated this afternoon with fine spells increasing. However, rain developing tomorrow morning, turning to showers tomorrow evening, but clearing in north and central Otago. The Chatham Islands rain heavy at times, easing to a few showers tomorrow morning. It's eight minutes past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina Batten, and thank you everyone for joining us. Coming up on the programme, the Operation Burnham Inquiry just announced the CTV building a review of the decision to not prosecute is being sought in the Commonwealth Games. We are there. But first, a storm that battered Auckland last night has left a trail of destruction across the city and other parts of the North Island. We will be there too. But in Auckland, the storm downed trees, damaged homes and left an unprecedented number of people without power. Schools and kindergartens left without power were forced to close for the day and some businesses who couldn't access generators were forced to shut up shop. Debris on the runway at Auckland Airport also forced flights to be diverted. Some of those people are still in Christchurch and will be there soon. In a moment we'll have the latest on the outages from Vector's head of networks. But first Zach Fleming and cameraman Nick Monroe on the streets of Auckland with residents, some of whom had a very lucky escape. Usually an unfamiliar sound in the central city. But this morning it's what many Aucklanders woke up to. Tree mulches were kept extremely busy with hundreds of trees brought down overnight, crushing cars and homes. This Papatoetoe homeowner could only get arborists to secure the tree that fell onto his house. They were too busy to completely remove it. It happens, you know. Winds regularly topped 120 kilometres an hour, with one gust recorded at 213 kilometres an hour. Nearly at the level of a Category 4 cyclone.
But it was people on the ground most impacted, with power lines felled by trees across the city. I heard something behind me, like something rumbling, <laughs> um, and I, I felt it coming towards us, and then it was just... Literally, it felt like it crashed against the house and a, a big sort of white light just it felt like, like an explosion. Vasanti Bana was hunkered down inside her Onehanga home watching television around 9.30pm when this massive tree, at least 50 metres tall, narrowly missed her home, but littered her property with live power lines. We were all shaken up. My sister was just in the la um, passage and she, you know, was pretty shaken up as well. So and it, it, the power just went out, everything just, the lights went out. These power lines were actually brought down by a tree from across the road. And yeah, having no power is a nuisance, but this could have been much worse. If this tree had have fallen the other way, it would have crushed a house. And more luck, Vasanti woke to power and a hot shower. Her electricity comes from the road perpendicular. But more than 120,000 homes and businesses, close to a quarter of Auckland's residents, weren't so lucky. They woke this morning with no electricity, which caused chaos on the roads with traffic lights down across the region. NZTA used the large signs on State Highway 1 to warn motorists, and police were deployed to major intersections to direct traffic. Many businesses were forced to close for the day, even Housing New Zealand and Mount Roskill couldn't open though some shop owners got creative and used torches to show customers around, providing they could pay cash. Others were quick and nabbed a generator. Kanwal Sandu filled his ice cream fridges with nearly $1,000 worth of stock yesterday and couldn't afford for it to melt. I came here at 6 o'clock and found uh, no power. In fact, the alarm was going. The generator is hard for nearly $100 a day, so I want to keep my ice cream safe. Vector says it has 100 crews out across Auckland trying to get power restored as quickly as possible. But it could take days to get the estimated 100,000 homes and businesses still black back on the grid. And after that comes a likely large bill for insurers. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. Yes, let's get the latest on those numbers. Uh, how many people are still off uh, for the latest? We're joined now by Vector's Head of Networks Programme Delivery, Minora Fredrickson. Uh, Minora, it's nice to have you with us. What at the height was the number of homes and businesses without power? Yes, good evening, John. Um, quite a hectic night. Probably at the height of it, we had in the order of around about 160 to 180,000 homes out. Um, as of 4 p.m. this afternoon, we're down to around about 91,000 homes. So we've made right, some right. Good progress. So, so you've got 50 percent of them back on. Yes, that's right. Okay, so that's good work. And the issue is, I guess, the trees. Is it in most cases, is the loss of power down to uh, trees falling across lines? That's correct, John. In a large number of cases, is trees, and, and it's been noted some of those trees are very large. So um, it's not such a straightforward exercise for our, our crews to just go in there and remove the trees. We've had to get the tree specialists in to cut them up. Um, and then we've got to go through our safety process to isolate and then bring the power back on again. You put out um, a media release last night saying Vector activates storm response. So in fact, unlike many people, you were on standby for this event. You knew a major storm was coming. Were you ready enough to start up with the remedial action as soon as you could? Um, yes, we, we basically started as soon as it was safe for us to do so. Um, this storm was um, extremely large, obviously, with gusts between 140k and up to 200k recorded in some cases. Um, and as you can imagine, from a public and, and a crew safety sort of thing, we had to make sure that the, the crew safety came first. Um, so a lot of the work we did initially was just assessing where the damage was. Um, so when the winds died down and it was safe to get in there, we could start doing the repair work. It's a miserably so cold we're, night. We're, so those, so those 90,000 homes that are still without power, uh, are you getting some more back on tonight, do you hope? Yes, so our crews will be working through tonight. Um, so we'll be, we'll be changing out our crews from the day, day shift out around about 10 o'clock tonight and then the new shift to work through till around about 6, six to 7 tomorrow morning. So the guys will be working throughout the night around the clock to try to get the power back as quickly and as safely as we can. Um, but obviously some areas will not be with power for a few days. And, and when, when you say a few days, what do you think uh, is the longest length of time anyone might expect to wait at this stage? We're, we're anticipating a few days, but um, we're also um, cognizant that there's some more bad weather in the way in the next couple of days, so that may result in some of those restorations um, 
increasing and people losing power again as some trees which have been weakened actually come down in that second blast. So hopefully it's not going to be as, as much wind as, as previously um, and that may extend the restoration time in some cases. Is the infrastructure too vulnerable to events like this? Should trees be able to take 180,000 homes off the grid? Well, I guess the thing is that, um, you, know, from a reg you know, from a regulatory perspective, we've got a corridor we can trim trees, but the big trees often are a long way away. So, you know, people have talked about trees being 30 metres plus long. So even if you do trim trees close, you know, even a, a certain distance from our lines, a 30 metre tree is that far away that um, there's nothing that we can do in terms of our design to, to protect against that. And your app and website, which uh, people go to, obviously, to find out what's going on and when they might be back. Uh, on the grid. Both of them failed last night. That will be something you're looking at, right? Absolutely, and we do apologise for that. Um, I think the important thing to stress to our customers is that while they may not have been able to access the application, um, the crews are out there and we are aware um, of, of their outages and we will get, those, get to those people's outages. Menorah Fredricksons, who is the vector head of Networks Program Delivery, joining us live. So 180,000 homes out at its height, about half of them back on, but some will take days. We'll try and get a lowdown on what area those uh, homes are in. But the people are going to have to wait longest. It's bitterly cold by Auckland standards. Some of you in the South Island, of course, will be laughing at us, but by Auckland standards, it is a chilly old night. Meanwhile, in Christchurch Airport, hundreds of angry, stranded Malaysian Airlines travellers are now in line trying to check into a flight to Auckland. They were supposed to land in Auckland from Kuala Lumpur yesterday after bad weather forced the plane to land in Christchurch. But they say when they landed yesterday, well, they told their report, uh, they told our reporter, Logan Church, they had absolutely no support whatsoever from Malaysian Airlines. When we left, it looked like a refugee camp. There was just people all over the floor. I felt so sorry for the families, you know, people with families, old, elderly people. It was just no room left on the carpet even. And no food, nothing. And, um, but hell, you know, it's better than crash landing in Auckland, isn't it? Uh, I miss my work as well today because I had to go to work, but that's fine because there has been some climate issues. But the kind of experience I had with Malaysian Airlines, I think that it was not really expected. And this is my first and last time with Malaysian. So you wouldn't fly with them again? Not really. <laughs> I had a business meeting at 6 o'clock this evening, which I'm obviously not going to get to. So, uh, yeah, it's a bit frustrating. We know these things happen and, and you can't control the weather. Yeah, but you guys found accommodation last night? We did. We were very fortunate. We have a, a, a relative of my wife's who, who lives nearby, and she was able to put us up at short notice. Fortunately, she answered the text that was sent. Uh, that's passengers from a Malaysian Airlines flight that was supposed to land in Auckland, diverted to Christchurch, and they are still there. Let's cross now live to Logan Church, who was at the airport. Logan, what's the latest? Hi, John. Yes, well, I'm standing at the airport with, well, uh, the remains of those passengers trying to check into a flight from Christchurch to Auckland. Um, as you said, these passengers came in last night from Kuala Lumpur to, and I was supposed to land in Auckland, but of course, bad weather, but forced them down to Christchurch. And now they've spent the day waiting, trying to get onto a flight to get up, get up, um, back up to Auckland. And as you just heard before, the passengers here are not only overly happy with what's gone, what's gone on. I've been told that when they arrived, they had no support from the airline itself. There was nothing organised in terms of accommodation, in terms of food, and even just walking around the airport before, you could see piles of yoga mats turned into bedrolls, pillows and sheets lying in piles. Um, to be fair to Malaysia Airlines, they don't actually have, they don't actually operate out of Christchurch Airport. We, we understand they don't actually have any staff down here, but um, these residents, are, uh, these are tourists are not very, not very happy. Many coming back from holidays, many coming for, holiday, uh, for holidays, and all those plans and they have now been disrupted because they're now in Christchurch, and they're now trying to get back up to Auckland. And Logan, uh, just quickly, do you know when the last of the passengers will end up in Auckland? Well, according, I'm standing in front of the TV screen in the airport that has all the flight information, and it says that this connecting flight back up to Auckland um, will leave at about 6 o'clock. Um, whether that happens or not, I guess it's still up in the air. I mean, it's almost 20 past 5, and there's probably a good 
I guess about 60 people still waiting to check in. I went upstairs before to um, where you get your bags checked, and there's, there's still lines up there. So I guess all these um, passengers can do now is cross their fingers and hope they get on their on their way soon. Logan Church, thank you. We'll keep in touch with you. We really appreciate it. Logan Church live from the airport in Christchurch in the centre of the North Island on State Highway 4, northwest of Mount Ruapehu. The cleanup is underway in National Park. The tornado that tore through the village yesterday morning left 14 houses uninhabitable, with three of them looking likely to be write-offs. The cordon around the north end of the town remains in place. Our reporter Andrew McRae, rugged up against the cold, is there. National Park Village awoke to snow this morning and has been bitterly cold all day with a biting wind. Volunteers have been helping clear away debris lying around with the aim of making sure it isn't blown even further and become dangerous. John Scobie was having breakfast when the tornado struck yesterday. All of a sudden there was just a sudden noise, like somebody trying to break into my house. And uh, the trees outside were just going crazy. And I thought, gee, that's strange. That's strange. I said, the forecast for bad weather. But uh, it just stopped. It only lasted a minute. After the initial shock subsided, John Scobie went outside. Just had to walk around and found, gee, the absolute devastation. There were roofs off houses and... Somehow one house has even gone completely off the foundations. <laughs> Mike Smith has lived in National Park for more than 50 years. He's never seen anything like yesterday's storm. He was at home when the wind struck. It's just like a heap of wind, like a whirlwind, you know. It goes straight through our window. Mike Smith says the damage to his place has been amazing. And all the windows are gone, the chimneys. There's a big mess outside. The house next door, when it took that house, all the rubbish come over home on my property. But we can't go back into our house yet, not allowed to. Mike, his wife Cindy and three other people were given emergency accommodation last night and will probably be there again tonight. Civil Defence has led owners of the worst affected homes and their insurance assessors into the court in this afternoon, but only for a short time and they had to be accompanied. Controller Margaret Hawthorne says the 14 houses deemed not livable must remain closed off. Are some of those properties that are red stickered, for instance, are they likely to be at the point where they couldn't be repaired? Yes, think? there's um, at least two that we believe will probably... Well, one has actually demo self-demolished, the other one will probably need to be demolished and there could be a third. Two of the three are holiday homes and the other was rented by a local person. Margaret Hawthorne says the cordon will remain in place overnight but is likely to be lifted tomorrow. And in the meantime, the welfare centre will remain open at the school. In National Park for Checkpoint, Core Andrew McRae TNA. And the Met Service will join us later in the programme to look forward uh, over the next 24 hours or so at what the weather is going to do. Let's head across to the Gold Coast where the Silver Ferns have been crushed by yet another defeat at the Commonwealth Games, losing to England by nine goals in their final pool match. The team is now on tenderhooks waiting for the results of other games to go their way in the hope of securing a semi-final spot. That should actually happen. Uganda really have to thrash Scotland in order for New Zealand to not make it through. But as Bridget Tunnicliffe reports from the Gold Coast, even if they do make it, their confidence is in tatters. New Zealand beaten again. The Silver Ferns needed to draw or win their final pool game against England to guarantee a spot in the semi-finals. But England were stronger, picking up their biggest win ever over the Ferns. The captain, Katrina Grant, who was in tears after the game, says it's devastating. Yeah, it's really hard to talk about because, you know, that's not good enough and that's not how we wanted the things to end in pool play. Um, we can't leave things to other, other teams to try and get us to go through. That's not how we've ever, um, ever been and, it, and it's, it's really hard to take. Coach Janine Southby had to make changes in the shooting end in the second quarter after shooter to Pyatt Selby Rickett made just eight from 14 attempts. In came Bailey Mears, who only added three from four before she was subbed out in the final spell. Maria Folau had to carry the shooting load and Southby says they can't win with just one shooter. Yeah, Maria took a massive um, lot of responsibility out there today and she worked really hard in both positions to, to get available and put those shots through like we know she can do. And, you know, there's seven players out there and everyone's got to contribute to that performance against a team that's playing well. Uganda could edge the Silver Ferns out of the semi-finals if they beat Scotland by a hefty margin. While that's unlikely, it's not out of the question given some of the surprising results so far. 
Southby, who always comes across as calm on the sideline, says she's livid about the result. Yeah, I do get angry. Yeah, and, you know, it might not look it on the outside, but right now there's a whole lot of us that are pretty angry and disappointed and frustrated as normal run of emotion. So, you know, often in anger, you don't say the best things, and it's about making sure that you do say the right things. Frustrated fans who travel to the Gold Coast to watch New Zealand are nervous about their chances now. They've got to get no. there first. Yeah, they've got to get there, and if they're going to make changes, they won't make it. You, are you sick of all the changes that the coach is making? Absolutely, absolutely sick of them. They're lacking in confidence at the moment, making a lot of silly errors sort of thing, not, not uh, their usual selves. Even an Australian netball fan had some sympathy for the Silver Ferns. Well, yeah, how are they going to be uh, treated back home? I don't, yeah, I was a bit worried for them actually, yeah. I don't, they're not a bad team, are they? They just didn't shoot well today. Katrina Grant has been part of the team for a decade and admits this is the most difficult period she's experienced. It has been really tough at the moment because we've never been in this situation before and it's, it's really hard and um, we just got to keep getting the girls up and, and we need to, to really pull together. It's not over and we need to make sure it's not over and, and do everything we can. If New Zealand do make the semi-finals, they are likely to meet Australia, making it very difficult for them to make the gold medal match. Let's go now live to Bridget Tunnicliffe, who is going to beam in, we think, from the Gold Coast. Bridget, there you are. We can see you. Uh, looks like a rather glorious day across the, ditch, no, across the ditch. It's lovely to have you with us. Can you tell us what has to happen in the Uganda-Scotland game in order for the Silver Ferns to make it through to the semis? Yeah, OK, so that game starts at 6 o'clock and Uganda have to beat Scotland by a huge margin to knock the Silver Ferns out of the semi-finals. There isn't a magic number, it's a little bit complicated, but I'm told around about 37 goals, and uh, around about 37 goals, but it's a little bit more complicated than that, but if, yeah, around 37 goals and Uganda can knock New Zealand out of the semi-finals. That seems really unlikely but it's not implausible because there have been a few funny results yeah, so far have. in the netball. Um, just to give you an idea, yeah just to give you an idea England beat Uganda by just uh, England beat Uganda by just six goals England also beat Scotland by 46 goals so if you look at it like that it, it's possible Yeah yeah it is, you're right though it, it does seem like a long shot but boy at these Commonwealth Games anything is possible uh, just just before we move on, what's your sense of the vibe in the camp? I, I felt like watching the game, and I'm here and you're there, but I felt like they were playing with a real weight on their shoulders. I mean, it just looked like it wasn't even anything close to being fun for them. Are they under enormous pressure, the Silver Ferns team? Yeah, I think they are. To be honest, I think they're pretty miserable right now. Um, for the past, say, two or three years, the Silver Ferns haven't, been great but the last six months I've completely unraveled um, and today when you saw the England team come off at the at the quarter break at the halftime break that the England players you saw them pumping their fists mm. they were huddling together they were they, they were just so enthusiastic I feel like the Silver Ferns maybe they're, they're overthinking things and the, the, the losses that they've had building up to this, this they're they're just, their confidence is completely shot. Yeah, yeah, boy, you could see that. Hey, um, some good news, and this is uh, a bronze medal in the boxing, Tasman Benny. I think it's the first ever medal for a New Zealand woman at the Games, isn't it? In, in boxing. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, so Tasman Benny, she's the first New Zealand woman to win a boxing medal at the Commonwealth Games. So the 19-year-old claimed bronze in the women's 45 to 48 kg division. So Benny actually lost to Northern Ireland's Christine uh, O'Hara today, but in boxing there are no bouts to decide the third place of the Commonwealth Games, so meaning she collected New Zealand's eighth bronze medal. Uh, also Benny's New Zealand teammate uh, Troy Troy Garton is guaranteed at least a bronze, having advanced to the semi-finals in the women's 60 kg division. And let's hope we're likely to win. A, more medals in the boxing. We've still got David Nika, who's very much in the hunt, and Alexis Pritchard. 
Bridget Tunnicliffe joining us live from the Games. Thank you very much indeed, Bridget. Breaking news uh, in the last hour or so, the government has announced it will hold an inquiry into claims a raid led by New Zealand soldiers in Afghanistan led to the deaths of civilians. The book Hit and Run, of course, alleged several civilians, including a three-year-old girl, were either killed or injured in the 2010 raid. National ruled out an inquiry when it was in power, but a short time ago, the Attorney General, David Parker, said an investigation will go ahead, he told reporters. That in deciding whether to initiate an inquiry, he looked at material, including some video footage of the operation. The footage I have reviewed does not seem to me to corroborate some key aspects of the book Hit and Run. It suggested to me that there was a group of armed individuals in the village. However, the material I have seen does not conclusively answer some of the questions raised and no amount of video evidence can. In light of that, and bearing in mind the need for the public to have confidence in the New Zealand Defence Force, I have decided in the public interest that an inquiry is warranted. My recommendation and the terms of reference have been endorsed by Cabinet. I would note that Dr Wayne Mapp, who was the Minister of Defence at the time of the operation, believes we owe it to ourselves to try to find out if civilian casualties did occur and if they did, to properly acknowledge that. I want to stress that the commissioning of this inquiry does not mean the government accepts the criticisms of the actions of SAS forces on the ground, although their conduct is squarely within the inquiry's purview and will be thoroughly and independently examined. The inquiry, established under the Inquiries Act 2013, will be undertaken by two people of the highest repute, former Supreme Court Judge Sir Terence Arnold, who will chair the inquiry, and Sir Geoffrey Palmer. Yes, Sir Terence Arnold and Geoffrey Palmer uh, will do the inquiry. That was Attorney General David Parker announcing this inquiry into the claims made in the hit and run book about Operation Burnham. The inquiry is expected to take a year to complete. <laughs> You are with Checkpoint on RNZ. Thank you for being with us. Coming up, families of people killed in the CTV building call on the government to review the decision to not prosecute engineers over the building's design. Christchurch dog owners protest a plan for menacing dogs to be muzzled even at home. And former Health Minister Jonathan Coleman bids farewell to Parliament and indeed to Checkpoint. We'd love your feedback. Don't forget you can text us 2101. You can email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. And we are, of course, on Facebook. Uh, Twitter and multitudinous platforms, Freeview Channel 50, Sky TV uh, and more. Thank you for being with us. Known next with business, but before it all, Katrina with the 532 headlines. The New Zealand Defence Force says it stands by its accounts of Operation Burnham in Afghanistan in 2010. The government says it will hold an inquiry into allegations the New Zealand-led raid led to civilian deaths, including that of a three-year-old child. The operation was the subject of the book Hit and Run by Nikki Hager and John Stevenson. The Defence Force Chief Lieutenant General Tim Keating says the book contains errors. The government is being urged to review the decision not to prosecute engineers over the design of the CTV building which collapsed in the February 2011 Christchurch quake with a loss of 115 lives. In November, the police said there was not enough evidence to justify prosecution. But the victims' families say the Deputy Solicitor General has told them knowledge of crucial information could have enabled a prosecution. That information includes the designer of the building being repeatedly told of its deficiencies. Vector is warning more outages are possible in Auckland after last night's big storm, with more strong winds forecast tomorrow. 129 lines are still down and 91,000 properties remain without power. Repair crews will be working through the night and will prioritise critical infrastructure such as cell phone towers and schools. Hundreds of travellers are stuck at Christchurch Airport after flights were diverted to and from Auckland due to storm damage. Air New Zealand is urging all of those with non-urgent travel to cancel flying today while it works to clear its backlog. 
The former Health Minister Jonathan Coleman says National did build new facilities to replace leaky buildings at Middlemore Hospital, but he was never made aware of the problems with rotting buildings. A former chair of the county's Monaco DHB, Lee Mathias, says she can't explain why Dr Coleman would not have known about them as a long-term investment plan, including the building's needs, was completed in November 2016. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six. Thank you very much, Katrina. We'll have more from Dr Coleman shortly. Let's turn to business news, though, with Nona Pelt. Hi, Nona. Uh, Kiwi Property has sold the North City Shopping Centre in Poriru, which is just north of Wellington, of course, right. uh, for $100 million, which is a lot of money. What are they going to do with it? Well, actually, it wasn't all they were hoping for. The valuation on the property was $106 million. Yeah. But uh, so, nevertheless, they also sold the Majestic Centre recently. That was just last year. Majestic Centre on that, Willis Street. Yeah, that's yeah. that big, big yep. tall office building. They sold that for 123 million plus, a bit more. And so, overall, it met their expectations. They're taking all of that money. They're going to use it to pay down all of you know as much debt as they can, and then they're going to reinvest that money into their retail space in Christchurch, but also here in Auckland at Sylvia Park. They're wanting to turn that into much more of a destination retail. <laughs> you, can't, you can't get into the damn place. If it's uh, any more of a destination, the motorway will come to a halt. Oh, well, really? Well, yeah. I've never actually been there. So well, it's, it's, you, it's, I, yeah. think, I think <laughs> I saw it once uh, going past the motorway. But it's obviously very popular. I spoke with the chief executive and he told me millions of people pass through there. So, well, there you go. Must the be car very park, popular. The car park is some Faustian... <laughs> <laughs> a, a Dante-esque vision of hell. Well, Nona, don't in the worry, John. He's going to spend some of that money to fix that and also rail link and office tower, you name it. So, look, don't worry. Lots of money is going into that investment to improve that for right. Aucklanders. And, again, there's a, a development in Christchurch that they're investing into. Pushpay, uh, the country which provides payment systems to churches in the United States. Have you heard of them before? No, I haven't, I thought we've Nona. talked about Actually, them. we probably have. <laughs> we have. You I'm don't in... recall. It <laughs> no. really left a big impression on you. Yeah. Well, well I Never so mind. They've doubled. So push pay uh, have doubled the revenue in the past year. That's right. So they're just getting more churches, are they? Yes, and not just you know they have New Zealand, Australia, Canada as well now. The United States, well, they've got a hundred churches. They're the biggest churches in the, in the United States uses their system to collect donish, donations so they from don't, their they parishioners. Don't, don't they pass around the hat anymore all the trail? No, you don't need to. You got an app for that. Wow. It's called Push Pay Holdings. That's right. So they're doing pretty well. So they uh, met their revenue target for the year. Very nice. Uh, they're still on track to list, uh, have a dual listing there in the United States, and they also are expecting to break even. And with that, you would think the market would say, "Wow." But no, no, they, they didn't. What did they say? They said, uh, your share price, share price marked you down 3%. Now, it could have been possibly profit takers. But more likely, it's... They were, uh, no, were non-believers. Non-believers. Uh, they probably thought that the company should be growing faster than its own expectations. Marked them down 3% anyways. Kiwi property was also down a bit. And that might be because the valuation was higher than the sale price. It's hard right. to know. What else happened on the market? But overall, the market was down just a little bit, nearly, well, just about 0.2%. 16 points only to 8,454, which is, you know, in line with what's going on in the Asia region. It's a bit mixed where there's still uncertainty over the trade deal that may or may not come between China and the U.S. And the dollar, we've hung on to our gains that we had overnight. So we're at 73 and a half U.S. cents. That's a quite a good hike overnight. 94.8 Australian and 51.8 pence. No, Nepeltia, thank you very much indeed. We've been talking a lot about the weather on the programme tonight, let's get the latest forecast from Mid-Service Meteorologist John Law. Kia ora, John. Kia ora. As we head through the next uh, couple of days, we have still got some severe weather warnings and watches to look at. As we head in towards uh, Thursday for the likes of Auckland and Northam, we start off dry with uh, some decent clear skies, but it will turn cloudy and there is some wetter weather moving up from the south with the chance of some more thunderstorms and some stronger winds. A severe weather watch in place for the northern parts as we go through the nighttime Thursday and Friday. Not to the same levels we saw recently, but still cold and I think a windy night to come Thursday into Friday. Friday. We are also going to find showers and some wetter weather pushing it back in towards Wellington as we go through the daytime. Temperature wise, highs of only 15 degrees Celsius in the capital and the winds are picking it back up through the afternoon as well. Generally, it's a drier start today across the North Island, but turning cloudier and some wetter weather return as we head through in towards the end of the day and some rumbles of thunder with that as well. 
as we head through and towards the afternoon, especially across that western side. Down the South Island, we're watching for some patchy rain running back towards us. Highs in Christchurch, 12 degrees Celsius, but some wetter weather towards the end of the day. Wettest weather though on that western coast of the South Island, more cloud through there as well. And we are going to find some wintry showers across the far southern parts of the country to start the day, but should it brighten up a touch for central Otago. Highs though, 10 degrees Celsius in Queenstown. And that's it from me. Thanks, John. Some low lows in the South do keep warm. The CTV families, we're back in Christchurch, have revealed explosive new information that if proven true would cast real doubt on the decision not to lay criminal charges over the building's collapse. The six-storey office block collapsed in the 2011 earthquake in Christchurch, killing 115 people. That was more than half the people who died in that earthquake. Late last year, following a three-year-long police investigation, it was decided no charges would be laid against the engineers that designed it due to a lack of evidence. But what's happened? Well, Conan Young with the latest. CTV family spokesperson Manel Casey says the new information was revealed to him and other family members during their meeting with the Deputy Solicitor General Brendan Horsley after the decision not to prosecute was taken. The families put it to Mr Horsley that the owner of the firm that designed the office block, Alan Ray, had been told on two occasions that the building had major deficiencies in its design that made it prone to collapsing in an earthquake. The first time was in 1986 during construction, when a city council engineer pointed out 13 problems that needed to be fixed. The second time was in 1990, 21 years before its collapse, when another engineer said it could fall over in an earthquake. On both occasions, Mr Al Casey says this advice was either ignored or did not result in effective remedies being taken. The family spokesperson says when these points were made to Brendan Horsley, he looked surprised and said he had not been told about this by Crown Prosecutor Mark Zarifa or Inquiry Head Superintendent Peter Reid. Mr Al Casey, who was making notes during the meeting, says the Deputy Solicitor General then told the families this information, quote, could be used to press charges for negligence. The room went silence and there was an overwhelming sense of disbelief that having heard Mr. Hosley respond, it appeared to us that he was unaware of a critical information and accordingly had not taken this into account before reaching his decision not to prosecute. Manel Casey said the inquiry head, Superintendent Peter Reid, told the families he was unhappy Brendan Horsley had decided to go against the police advice based on a three-year-long investigation that 115 charges of manslaughter should be laid against Alan Ray. He says Mr Horsley's decision was clearly wrong. It's simply outrageous that the person who essentially took the whole decision and advised the police to change their decision was not aware of all facts. The CTV families have sent signed affidavits to the Prime Minister and the Attorney General David Parker dealing with the revelations made by Brendan Horsley in the meeting and calling for a review of the decision not to prosecute. This is actually their chance to put, to put their own signature on this matter and show that justice can be actually achieved for such a very clear case, for a case that has been going on for more than seven years now. A response has been sought from the Deputy Solicitor General, Brendan Horsley, the Head of the Police Inquiry, Peter Reid, and David Parker. None of them have replied so far. In Ōtōtahi for Checkpoint, Ko Conan Young Tene. Yes, we'll update you if we receive any replies. The police say they've only just received a copy of Mr Alcazi's speech and will take time to consider its contents before they're in a position to make any further comment. Obviously, that is a story we will keep a close eye on. Coming up to 17 minutes to 6, and the political career of former Health Minister Jonathan Coleman comes to a set piece close tonight with his valedictory speech being delivered in Parliament. There will be a by-election in the North Coat electorate. Dr Coleman will become the CEO of a private health company. But his contribution to public health is still very much under debate and we will have more on that in future days. 
At the moment, assessments of his performance as minister are focusing on what he knew and when about the condition of buildings at Middlemore Hospital. Now, Lee Mathias, chairman, sorry, chairperson of the county's Monaco DHB between 2013 and 2016, was asked by Guyan Espinel on Morning Report what she told Dr Coleman about problems with buildings at Middlemore during her time. There are various processes that we go through in putting forward capital plans. And in the 10 years prior, uh, up until 2016, there were, there were two major, major long-term investment plans done. One well before my time, which went uh, certainly through Wellington and clearly identified all of the buildings that needed to be replaced on that site. And there were a number, uh, because in the late 90s, a number of buildings were built uh, very quickly and they were caught by the built, leaky building um, uh, problem that Auckland had, and that included the mental health building uh, and several others. Um, uh, all of that was quite well known. I'm not quite sure why people keep thinking this is, is, is a secret. It is well known. Staff uh, had it in one of their briefings quite clearly about the mental health building. Uh, where the uh, but, OK, but can you point clear. to a document? I mean, I, I, you know, I'd love to see it. Can you point to a document or a specific time when the minister was made aware because we go to the new minister who says himself right up till March of this year he didn't know either so maybe you're right and great if you are let's see a document or a date or some evidence that you actually did tell the minister because he's very clear that he did not know the extent of these problems. Okay. In, in November 2016, a long-term investment plan was completed for uh, Counties Manica DHB. It's, it's quite in detailed. there, is it? It's in there? Absolutely. Absolutely. Lee Mathias talking on Morning Report this morning. Dr Coleman has declined our requests for interviews on this matter, but our political editor, Jane Patterson, asked him what he knew during his time as Health Minister about structural problems or problems with leaky buildings on the Middlemore Hospital campus. Look, I was never informed of uh, major structural or leaky problems, and certainly these four new buildings and the revelations that we've had in the past few weeks were all news to me. I mean, obviously, there were hundreds of millions of dollars invested there during our time in government. I signed off the business case for a new mental health unit. Uh, there was a $300 million um, clinical services building actually opened under national. So, look, there's a difference between a planning process, which, of course, the government was involved in over time. That's quite different from sudden revelation of catastrophic problems. And I think it's very instructive that the new minister, David Clark, said that he knew nothing about any of these catastrophic issues uh, when they were raised in the media in March. So, you know, there's clearly new developments as opposed to a long-term planning process, and the new developments uh, have been a real revelation to everyone involved in Middlemore. But the mental health facility was replaced because of issues with leaky buildings, is that correct, that you signed off on? Yeah, and that's the point. So a problem was identified and the building was replaced. So, you know, that planning and rejuvenation uh, process is uh, quite distinct from a sudden revelation that, hey, we've got, you know, these problems with four major buildings. Ministers were never told about that. So when you were discussing the mental health facility or the need for um, long-term planning for new building, were there any other discussions about problems with those four buildings raised? Look, not that I can recall, but of course, you know, over time with all hospitals, they've got a huge number of assets. Uh, they've got, uh, you know, millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars involved with buildings. And over time, things need to be repaired and replaced. But the point is, there's been this sudden revelation in the media of uh, major problems with Middlemore Hospital. Now, if anyone had said, look, these four buildings have you know, these catastrophic problems, that would have gone to the top of the list. So there had been discussions about the need to upgrade infrastructure at Middlemore in terms of, and I suppose the mental health facility would have given an indication that was there was some capital funding needed and there the were problems with some of the buildings on that campus. Oh, no, there weren't direct discussions around that that I can specifically recall. But, look, the, 
point is there's a difference between a long-term plan that Middlemore had you know, over the coming years to continually uh, upgrade its facilities. That's quite different to the sudden revelation that actually the buildings have you know, something really major wrong with them that needs immediate attention. And that second set of circumstances is what we're in now. So as I say, um, why wasn't this raised at the Select Committee on February the 21st? Um, it seems to me that the DHB have only been recently aware of the full extent of these uh, problems. And as we were hearing in question time yesterday, um, you know, October the 25th, a meeting of the DHB was when the DHB itself suddenly became aware of what the extent of the situation actually is, as opposed to, you know, things that need to be progressively maintained and repaired. But of course, that doesn't seem to have been raised with the new Minister of Health. October the 25th was the day before the new government was sworn in. David Clark says um, he knew nothing about it. So that's, you know, an intervening period of five months between the DHB meeting on October 25th and David Clark finding out in the media. So Lee Mathias, the former board chair, this morning alluding to the fact that you may have known through the process of the long-term planning and she referred specifically to a November 2016 report in which she suggests that there was some mention of structural issues or the problems that have since arisen. Well, look, Lee and I will have to agree to disagree on that. But the point is, no one ever came to me and said, hey, we've got a major problem here, which the government and you as minister need to uh, turn your attention to right now. That's quite different from the current situation, which the new minister is faced with, which is a major problem, which needs immediate action. And look, you know, the new government, as Simon Bridges has said, should just get on and fix it. They said they'd put a whole lot of new money in health. Well, it sounds like it's needed at Middlemore now. There has been a view expressed that DHBs were scared of raising issues with you, that the national government discouraged them from bringing up any funding problems or anything else. What is your response to that? That is completely incorrect. I mean, basically, I said to DHB chairs whenever I met with them, look, you've got my mobile phone. Text me if there's any issue I need to know about. You know, we operate under the no surprises policy. And over the years, many of them did do that. Um, so the whole uh, basis of, of working together was, look, you need to let me know about important stuff. Text me and I will get back to you. Was there a more overriding message from the government, though, rather than a personal relationship between you and DHB chairs, that to manage within your budgets and we want you to make do with what you've got? Well, they certainly had to manage within budgets, but that's been the same um, whichever party has been in government over a long period. But managing within your budgets doesn't mean uh, not telling the government about major problems which you know politicians would need to know about. So there was a clear expectation that I'd be kept informed uh, at all times of issues that were serious that I should know about, especially anything to do with patient safety. And frankly, the vast majority of DHB chairs, if not all of them, as far as I knew, did that. The former Health Minister, Jonathan Coleman, speaking to our political editor, Jane Patterson. The meme makers had a field day. People who relish the use of the English language to illuminate rather than obfuscate may have been in the fetal position. The New York Times analysed his suit, but Wall Street thought Mark Zuckerberg was great. The Facebook CEO's first ever congressional testimony went so well that shares of the social media giant saw their biggest one-day percentage gain since April 2016. And whatever the privacy issues being addressed or evaded, access to all all those people makes Facebook a $470 billion business. Conway Gittins from Reuters reports. It was supposed to be the great clash between Silicon Valley and Capitol Hill, but Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg's highly anticipated Senate testimony Tuesday did not turn into a congressional brawl, despite opening warnings from Republicans and Democrats. In the past, many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle have been willing to defer to tech companies' efforts to regulate themselves. But this may be changing. If Facebook and other online companies will not or cannot fix the privacy invasions, then we are going to have to. We, the Congress. 
Zuckerberg clearly came prepared. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. I started Facebook, I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. Under fire for allowing Russian operatives to spread propaganda on the social network during the 2016 U.S. presidential election, and for the unauthorized collection and selling of data on more than 80 million Facebook accounts, Zuckerberg was calm, apologetic, patient, humorous, but most of all, careful. Several times throughout his testimony, Zuckerberg pledged to change the way data are accessed and whether, quote, issue ads, like the ones used by the Russians, are placed on the platform at all. He even agreed to help lawmakers do their job. Would you work with us in terms of what regulations you think are necessary in your industry? Absolutely. Okay. Would you submit to us some proposed regulations? Yes, and I'll have my team follow up with you. His testimony given high marks on Wall Street as he dodged direct questions on how much data Facebook is really scooping up and hinted at a paid version of the social network. Investors pushed Facebook stock up 4.5% in the biggest one-day percentage gain in almost two years. Zuckerberg is back on Capitol Hill Wednesday, this time to testify before a House committee. Yes, that report from Reuters and monetary terms, that uh, gain was worth about $21 billion added to the stock price today. The tornado that slammed into Rahotu in Taranaki cut a sway through Paddy and Philly Mullins' Kahui Road property, bringing down power lines, ripping out trees and sending buildings flying. Today, the tight-knit rural community has rallied around to help the couple who reckon their family is lucky to be alive after being really squarely hit by a ferocious little storm. Our Taranaki reporter Robin Martin has more. A hardy crew of farmers, tradesmen, factory workers and even bankers turned up on the Mullins doorstep from around the mountain this morning wanting to lend the couple a hand. Paddy says he could only assume word got out about how bad things were. I think it's pretty horrific really in all fairness. We've probably lost a workshop, two workshops, we've lost uh, three hay barns, half a house, three uh, double garages, um, we've probably lost in excess of a hundred trees. Uh, there's iron strewn everywhere. Mr Mullins says things could have been much worse. His son Geordie share milks about 600 cows on the farm. He and a workmate, Jake Horrington, had a narrow escape when they had to hunker down in the milking shed as the storm passed overhead. Geordie and Jake are very lucky to be alive when that tornado came through and if they hadn't have been got in out of that they would have been God knows where they would have been. There's, there's a uh, 10,000 litre tank which had liquid in it it's disappeared and we can't even see it. It must have gone up over the main road somewhere. Mr Mullen was overwhelmed with today's turnout. We've had just people turn up, uh, a massive turn up, turnout from Pihama, which is south of uh, Opanaki, uh, guys from ANZ Bank. We've had guys from Hayden Priest from Oakura uh, turned up with a, a couple of guys in a truck and trailer. We've got guys from Fonterra with chainsaws. Um, yeah, no, it's fantastic. Family friend Chris Robinson says it was only right to give a hand to a mate in need. So what kind of things have you been doing? Oh, uh, swinging on a chainsaw at the moment. <laughs> oh, it's helping out the diggers, so it just makes it a little bit timely for him to get rid of the trees and then uh, shifting a whole lot of tin and, yeah, the remnants of uh, old sheds and stuff. It's amazing how much is strewn everywhere. Dennis O'Connor and Nick Shemansky had come out from the petrol station in Oakura. When we found out this had happened, the boss said, get out there and help. And we said, for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. So what have you been doing? Then? Picking up iron. And Clearing up the roadside with the iron. The wind gets up and the iron just flies everywhere. It's ultra dangerous. Farmer Hugh Wilson had come from even further afield. I've come from Inglewood over the other side of Mount Egmont. It's about an hour's drive. We had a bit of wind around there, but nothing like here on the coast. Yeah, so why are you here? Uh, we, we heard on the news on Radio New Zealand actually that um, some houses had roofs blown off. My concern as a farmer is all the corrugated iron that's lying around the paddocks. If the wind comes up again, uh, that's going to hurt people. Philly Mullins says the huge response is a reflection of the coastal farming community. Absolutely amazed at the support and people that we didn't even actually, I mean most of these guys we know, but there's some people here that we don't actually know that well. 
and um, no, it's, it's brilliant. We really appreciate it. It's, it's quite humbling, oh, isn't it, Paddy? Paddy Mullins says he expects it will be at least a week before the power is back on all over the farm, and he hasn't yet even begun to calculate how much the tornado has cost the business in dollar terms. I Taranaki Moti Hotaka Uti Ahi Ahi, Ko Robin Martinaho. Lots of texts coming in tonight, uh, people texting 2101 asking why if trees are the issue in Auckland with the city's power lines, 180,000 homes without power last night, uh, Vector doesn't take the lines underground. I think it's a cost issue but we will ask that but it would be extremely expensive to do so but it's a good question, lots of you asking it by text. No one is asking by text who the oldest man in the world is or how he's looking but we're going to answer the question anyway, I'll text in and ask it. OK, John, thanks for asking. The reply is his name is Masazo Nonaka. He's 112 years old. He's in Japan, Hokkaido, the northernmost island. And he's just gone into the Guinness World Book of Records as the oldest living man. This short report from Edward Baran. This is what it looks like to live to 112. Masazo Nonaka, who lives in Japan's northernmost Hokkaido, was recognised as the oldest man living by Guinness World Records on Tuesday in a special ceremony. Nanaka was born on July 25, 1905, 42 days before the Russo-Japanese War ended. A farmer and lumberjack in his youth, Nanaka ran a hot spring resort in his hometown Ashoro, where he raised two sons and three daughters. Local welfare authorities say he has an insatiable appetite for sweets, especially strawberry shortcake. He was presented with a cake but could only enjoy the whipped cream on top as he can no longer eat solid foods. So there we are, that question answered, 112 years old. Uh, it's coming up to six o'clock. RNZ News at 6. Ngā mihi. Good evening. Ko Katrina Batten. Aho. An inquiry is to be held into allegations a New Zealand-led raid in Afghanistan in 2010 led to civilian deaths. In their book, Hit and Run, published last year, Nikki Haga and John Stevenson claimed the previous government tried to cover up the raid, but National ruled out an inquiry. Here's our Deputy Political Editor, Chris Bramwell. Announcing the inquiry this afternoon, the Attorney General David Parker said he reviewed a lot of material that, in his view, did not corroborate key aspects of the book. But he said the material also does not conclusively answer some of the questions raised by the authors. Mr Parker says in light of that and the need for the public to have confidence in the Defence Force, an inquiry is warranted. It will be undertaken by a former Supreme Court judge, Sir Terence Arnold, and Sir Geoffrey Palmer. It's expected to take about a year to complete. Ata with your Party Mata ko Chris Bramalahau. Both the police and Crown Law say they'll consider fresh claims being made by the CTV families before commenting. The families are calling on the government to review the decision not to prosecute engineers over the design of the building that collapsed in the February 2011 earthquake. On the basis of Crown Law advice, the police said last November that there was not enough evidence to justify prosecution. But representatives of the family have today claimed the Deputy Solicitor General told them he was not aware of crucial information that could have enabled a prosecution to go ahead. The building minister, Jenny Salesa, has defended her ministry's lack of action over aluminium panel cladding on high-rises. Serious questions have been raised by the only independent audit the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment has sought about how the panels are certified. That audit, leaked to RNZ last week, recommended the ministry suspend the certification of most panels, even fire-resistant ones. In Parliament this afternoon, National MP Andrew Bailey asked why Ms Salesa had not done that. MB advice is that the report the member is referring to did not have sufficient supporting material to justify further action. Officials have sought an independent peer review, which is expected in the next few weeks. Jenny Salesa. The engineering audit came to the Ministry last November and it ordered the peer review on March the 6th. In the meantime, certifications are continuing. Hundreds of travellers are stuck at Christchurch Airport because of Auckland storm. The Auckland Airport runway was temporarily closed last night, causing flights to be diverted elsewhere. This passenger was on a flight from Kuala Lumpur that was supposed to land in Auckland but was diverted to Christchurch. She says they were able to stay with a relative in Christchurch but others weren't so lucky. 
when we left it looked like a refugee camp. There was just people all over the floor. I felt so sorry for the families, you know, people with families, old elderly people. It was just no room left on the carpet even. And no food, nothing. And, um, but hell, you know, it's better than crash landing in Auckland, isn't it? Air New Zealand is urging all of those with non-urgent travel not to fly today while it works to clear its backlog. Temperatures are forecast to plummet in the South Island tonight, making wet roads icy and bringing frost to the mainland for the first time this year. The mercury will dip to one degree in Christchurch and minus one in Reefton. A Met Service forecaster Tom Adams says motorists will need to watch for morning ice and growers could also be affected. Agriculture, horticulture, um, need to be aware it's going to be a cold night tonight. Take relevant precautions. Tomorrow night looks a little bit warmer as a, as a fast-moving front crosses over and then getting cold again on Friday, potentially down to minus two in Queenstown. Forecaster Tom Adams. A survey for teacher unions suggests majority support for teacher pay going up by at least 10%. The Educational Institute and the Post-Primary Teachers Association say the results should give the government good reason to boost their members' pay this year. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen reports. A thousand people responded to the survey and 83% agreed teachers deserve a pay rise. 55% said the increase should be 10% or more, but 15% believe there should be no increase at all. The unions say big pay rises are needed to tackle the teacher shortage and to persuade more people to stay in the job for longer. Primary school teachers start their collective bargaining next week and the Educational Institute says it's seeking a 16% increase over two years. Call John Gerritsen in TNA. It's four and a half past five, uh, six. Sport, the Silver Ferns' hopes of making it to the Commonwealth Games semi-finals now rely on Scotland. By losing their final pool game to England today, New Zealand failed to guarantee themselves a top four spot and Uganda could advance if they beat Scotland by 37 goals or more. On the plus side, Tasman Benny has become the first New Zealand woman to win a Commonwealth Games boxing medal. She picked up bronze in the 45 to 48 kilo division. I think I've learned quite a lot by just the fights I've had and just getting used to all like the TVs and cameras and everything. Like I'm glad that I get to take a medal back for New Zealand for my first Commonwealth Games. Pretty cool. Tasman Benny. Troy Garten is guaranteed at least a bronze, having advanced to the semi-finals of the women's 60 kilo division. The former New Zealand cricket captain Jeff Crow, who was match referee during the recent controversial South Africa-Australia Test Series, says he has never seen such animosity between two teams. Crow's remarks were made in an ICC document detailing a successful appeal by South African bowler Kagiso Rabada against a two-match ban following the second test. The Chiefs will hold off until match day to decide where the first five Damian McKenzie plays against the Hurricanes in their Super Rugby match final. In their Super Rugby match, McKenzie suffered a hip injury in last week's win over the Blues. That's the news. Tempest, chunks of debris everywhere, huge branches, little branches just everywhere across the road here at ANZ. There's a big tree that's blocking the road that's come down. Twisters. The wind gusts were comparable to a high-end Category 1 or a low-end Category 2 tropical cyclone. Technology. And if we find any suspicious activity, we're going to conduct a full audit of those apps to understand how they're using their data and if they're doing anything improper. And if we find that they're doing anything improper, we'll ban them from Facebook. Status update. Morning report with Susie Ferguson and Guy and Espen a weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, new research reveals the geographic lottery that is health care for elderly New Zealanders accessing residential care. And after 10, English novelist Rose Tremaine on her revealing new memoir. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after morning report on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow for the North Island. Scattered rain or showers with hail and possible thunderstorms about coastal areas. Clearing tomorrow morning but returning during the afternoon or evening. For Nelson and Marlborough, excluding the Kaikoura coast, fine today, becoming cloudy tomorrow morning, then scattered rain during the afternoon and evening. For Canterbury and the Kaikoura coast, showers, some heavy with hail and possible thunderstorms, clearing overnight. However, scattered light rain from late tomorrow morning. Buller 2 for Yordland, fine today, rain spreading north tomorrow, briefly heavy, easing to isolated showers tomorrow evening. 
Southland and Otago, showers becoming isolated this afternoon with fine spells increasing. However, rain developing tomorrow morning, turning to showers tomorrow evening, but clearing in the north in north and central Otago. The Chatham Islands rain heavy at times, easing to a few showers tomorrow morning. It's just gone eight past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina Batten. We began the programme tonight looking at the storm uh, and getting an update on the numbers. 180,000 homes were without power in Auckland. Very high percentage of the homes in the city uh, at the height of the storms last night. They've got about 50% of those homes reconnected to the grid. So about 90,000 still without power. Some will remain without power for days. It was a brutal old storm by Auckland standards. It battered the city, splintered trees, uh, wrenching roofs from homes. Uh, causing quite a lot of damage, but the power cutoff was the big thing. The Sky Tower recorded a peak gust of 146 k an hour, a speed that would be typical of a Category 2 tropical cyclone, and there were stronger gusts elsewhere, particularly uh, along the coast just south of the city. With temperatures forecast to drop again tonight and more wind on the way, authorities are urging Aucklanders still with our electricity to make contingency plans and do be careful on the roads. Uh, Eva Corlett filed this report. Wind gusts of more than 210 kilometres an hour hammered Auckland last night, prompting more than 1,600 call-outs to the fire service for help with securing roofs and dealing with uprooted trees. Falling trees knocked down power poles and downed lines, cutting power to 200,000 Aucklanders, a fifth of the city's properties. The West Auckland suburb of Glen Eden was among those badly hit, with streets today smelling of freshly cut wood as large tree branches were chainsawed up and cleared away. One resident, Sarima Vakasonga, has no power and a trampoline embedded in her fence after what she described as a terrifying night. It flew over from the property across the road, with cars forced to stop as it tumbled to its final destination. I just told my husband, hey, there's something big around the gate. And then <laughs> when he came out, he saw this uh, big trampoline. The Titarangi fire crew's been out in Glen Eden, mostly helping with property damage and clearing trees. Station officer Ken Manderson says it's been a busy day. And uh, as you can see, there's quite a bit of debris and uh, fallen trees and property damage in the area. So at the moment, we are very, very heavily inundated with calls that continue to come in. More than 90,000 Auckland properties are still without power and lines company Vector is urging people to make plans in case they have no electricity tonight. Some properties may not be reconnected for several days. Vector says Auckland has faced power cuts like this before, in 2014 when there were four major storms one after the other. Its head of network programme delivery, Minoru Fredriksson, says Vector has more than 100 field outage staff working across the region. We had about four major storms for April, May, June and July, um, which had sort of um, numbers up similar to what we had before. So. That year was particularly stormy. Hopefully we're not having a repeat this year. 60 schools and early childhood centres were closed today in Auckland, the Waikato and Taranaki due to the bad weather. The principal of Te Atatu Intermediate in West Auckland, Noel Fletcher, says the roof of a nearby business was completely blown off and ended up in the school grounds. We had um, roofing iron all over the drive with nails and you know all sorts. Then um, when we came through the other gate, that was also blocked with a fallen over tree. So I went down to the last gate and uh, managed to get in there. Te Atatu Intermediate was closed today, but hopes to reopen tomorrow. The weather chaos has resulted in hundreds of home and car insurance claims being lodged, a week's worth in one night, according to AA Insurance. Down at the West Haven Marina, many boats were damaged. A yacht at Pier 21 lay on its side, leaning against another boat, its ropes snapped and whipping in the wind. Natasha from the Canopy and Squab Shop has been surveying the storm's impact. The awning on the building here has partly blown off and then come through the windows. There's also quite a lot of tree damage with debris everywhere and a lot of boats have had their sails ripped off them, awning tracks and that have been pulled off boats and their boat covers are needing repairs. I tamaki makaurau mo te hōtaka o te ahiahi, ko Eva Corlett, tēnei. 
Some Aucklanders are saying they didn't receive enough warning and were left unprepared for the severity of last night's storm. But emergency management and the Met Service have defended their response, saying plenty of red flags were raised. We certainly discussed it on Checkpoint last night that a belter was coming. Katie Scotcher reports. From Monday, Met Service was warning that severe gales gusting at 120 kilometres an hour could hit Waikato, Auckland and the Coromandel Peninsula on Tuesday evening. Yesterday morning, Auckland Emergency Management took to social media to advise people to secure loose items in their backyards and to remember to bring their pets inside. When the storm finally hit in earnest last night, wind gusts of more than 210 kilometres an hour were recorded, while sustained winds of 100 kilometres an hour battered the city for much of the night. And it seems many Aucklanders were caught off guard. Um, I didn't hear about it, it's just that the building was swaying and the um, glass windows were kind of being pushed in, so it was quite scary. I did say to my husband, did we know this was coming, and he said no. I heard about it the night before last that storms might be coming, um, and I think I got enough uh, warning. Nothing whatsoever. I've got my phone in my hand and it's home. There's nothing whatsoever that I, I, I do know about. Met Service meteorologist Lisa Murray says they gave plenty of warning and couldn't have done much more. On Monday, when those first warnings were issued, we contacted uh, the local council, civil defence, and also you know power companies and our clients as well, just to give them the heads up that this was coming. So that it's all about trying to be prepared, and part of that preparation is checking the forecast. The Met Service says its forecast was spot on. But weatherwatch.co.nz's head forecaster, Philip Duncan, says the storm was more intense than anticipated. We were aware of it, but um, I, I think it's fair to say that the whole event was about one notch above what we were forecasting. It was certainly a bit more wild than the, than the forecast was saying before it arrived, even though we were saying some severe weather is on its way. The Director of Auckland's Emergency Management, John Jagisevich, has defended their response to the widespread damage caused by the storm. He says plenty of warning was provided and their response was similar to those of previous storms. The uh, information uh, to be ready and be prepared, uh, certainly as, as our emergency providers were, uh, was out there and could be heard if, if people were uh, willing to access their social media, their radio or turn on the TV. John Jagisevich agrees with the Met Service that the intensity of the storm matched forecasts. For Checkpoint, call Katie Scotcher 10 Quarter past six. It wasn't as unexpected as their loss to Malawi, but it was a loss of 54-45, their biggest ever losing margin to England, and their second loss of the Commonwealth Games. In short, the Silver Ferns, also known as the national netball team, are up against it on the Gold Coast. Reliant on Uganda are beating Scotland by not beating Scotland by an historic margin in order to progress to the semi-finals. There, they're likely to face Australia, who they've only defeated twice in their last 12 contests. In short, it's not getting any. Any easier for the Silver Ferns. Former Silver Ferns coach and player, of course, Yvonne Willering, spoke to us just after the game. If you actually take the score out of the equation, we probably, it was the best some of the Ferns have played for a while. The whole game had intensity and intercepts were taken, you know, and the ball was played with far more confidence, particularly the in-circle of Whakahakatau and Grant. They got a number of intercepts, so, you know, that hasn't happened in past games. But, you know, in the end, especially in that last quarter, opportunities went begging and we just didn't seize the moment. And a 73% success rate uh, shooting is not good enough at this level, is it? Yeah, at times, though, it became the Whakahakatau and the Falau show. I mean, really, Maria took the most pressure in that whole game. Selby Ricketts, really nervous start. You know, I thought that she would start better, didn't. Uh, and in the end, they made the substitution with Mess. But the mess uh, Falau combination hasn't really worked, and that's why they reverted back to Selby Ricketts. But, you know, Falau certainly took on the most pressure in that shooting role. And, you know, in that last quarter, yep, she missed some, some goals. But that's not what cost them the game. In that last quarter, they were already down, you know, and it was a situation where they had to play catch-up netball. They had to go for intercepts. They mistimed that at times, and uh, certainly England capitalised on it. And the Hart and Houseby shooting combination certainly made sure of the shots. So, so if Falau was playing really well at one end of the court, and Faka Hakatao was playing extraordinarily at the other yeah. end of the court, Yep. It, it was the it was the it was the quarter in between where we weren't quite on top of things, and I thought a couple of times we we looked burdened by the weight of it all. 
Yeah, we got to a situation. Also, substitutions were made um, going into that third quarter, and I held my breath because subs haven't that had time to settle. And against England, you couldn't give them the opportunities. England wanted to come out and show that in big games they were going to, you know, they were going to nail it. And in the past, we've been critical of them that when it really counted in competitions where it mattered, they faltered. And they have in the past, you know, World Champs and Commonwealth Games. And they even said after the game, "See, we can do it." So you can't afford, mm, you know, to mm. just let a goal, a couple of goals slip. And that's how they did it because at halftime, only two goals down, you know, and, and, and it was still there for the taking because I thought we had some great passages of play. Then we had some unforced errors. Unforced errors are the ones where the stepping calls called or the, the contacts being called, you know, and that's when we had to tidy it up. And uh, England certainly made the most of the, uh, the opportunities. But they also made mistakes, you know. That's why it was still there for the taking, yeah. even going yeah. into that last quarter. But really hard to, you know, start pegging it back uh, against the team. And England, they just seemed hungry. Katrina Grant's uh, post-match interview showed how much this meant. By goodness, she was uh, just devastated. So, so this is a team that wants to do it. It is a team that, as you're saying, at either end of the court really has the personnel to do it. But I, are they just... Is there something going wrong in the message they're getting from, from, from the coach, what she's the one, the five of the last 16 games under her? Or is there just a lack of self-belief? What's happening in the head? Yeah, and that's a hard one to answer because I haven't been at their trainings. I haven't, you know, so we don't know that. You know, do other players going out on court and sticking to game plans? Like, only they can answer that. The, so, you know, those are the interviews that have to be taken. But, um, yeah, it's it's a hard one, you know. And, and, you know, she showed emotion. And I don't actually have a problem with that because, you know, the questions were asked, you know, how much do they really want it? Although I hate that question because when you're wearing the fern, obviously you want it, you know. Some of the players are inexperienced and experience and knowing what it takes to actually put in the big wins and the big wins are in the tough competitions you know and uh, you, you, you have, I guess they're a little bit inexperienced in that not inexperienced as a team because their preparation going into the calm games they've played against all the different styles mm, of play yeah, both have. in the quad series yep, and the tiny Jamison so there can't have any excuses there but you know at the end of the day you know are we still looking that that midcourt isn't putting the ball through fast enough isn't doing the work on defence you know, it's it, it's a hard one, but you've got to also give credit to England. They certainly see, seize their opportunities. Yes, they did, and I think it's important to remember there are two teams in the game. It's a very yeah. good point. England, uh, England played well, although as you say in that last quarter, by golly, both teams were kind of conspiring to blow it, weren't they? One final question. Yeah. We're so grateful for your time and expertise, but. If, as looks likely, the Silver Ferns do go through to face Australia, we are going to have to improve yeah. so much. It, it's a sort of metamorphosis is almost required, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's a tricky one. And, you know, we're looking at this, and Malawi was uh, the pain that had fallen on our side, you know. And it's interesting, Malawi came to the party against us because subsequent to that, they only just beat Scotland by one goal. Mm. So, you know, they really took it to us in that game. But, uh, yeah, the Ferns, you know, it, when they, and I, they will make the semis. I can't see them not making the semis, you know. But they will see that as an opportunity now. You know, they were so close to not making it. No one wants to make it into a semis, you know, through the demise of someone else, you know, that we're waiting for the results of another game. But if they've been given this opportunity, you know, I say to them, look, you just go out there and make the most of this opportunity. But again, they've got to be very careful that they are performance focused, you know. I think at stages they became score focused They in this game. They saw that they were behind. You know, you saw them looking up at the scoreboard and I'm thinking, just do what you do best, you know. And when they had the passages of good play, it was really neat to watch, you know, but it just wasn't there again for the consistent 60 minutes and they certainly against Australia or Jamaica it's going to be an interesting game uh, tonight Australia-Jamaica um, you know, to see who we will be playing but both those teams are hungry for the gold Yvonne Willering talking to us after the game this afternoon in order for the Silver Ferns to not go through Uganda have to thrash Scotland well that game is underway uh, as we speak in fact uh, we're a wee way into it now Uganda are ahead but by nowhere near the margin that would keep the Silver Ferns out Uganda playing Scotland uh, Uganda would have to win by I think 37 goals to keep uh, the uh, Silver Ferns out lots of people saying actually we weren't warned 
uh, about the storm last night in Auckland. And people are saying on the TV news, the six o'clock TV news, normally when a big, big storm event's coming, they whack the weather person up near the top of the program and say, watch out for this. They didn't do any of that stuff. And people are saying, we had no idea it was going to be that bad. I have to say, we had Georgina Griffiths from the Met Service on Checkpoint last night. And she said, this is going to be an unusually strong storm with unusually strong winds for Auckland. I wonder also if there's a slight suspicion that Auckland, uh, that, that we're also soft here, that actually the storms aren't that bad and we just moan and grumble and so no one was taking the possibility of a storm as being a real storm as opposed to an Auckland storm but anyway lots of people are saying they had no idea how big it was going to be and had they had any idea they would have prepared accordingly we appreciate your feedback 2101 is the text number the SBCA says the Christchurch City Council would be breaching the animal welfare code if it enforces its new requirement for menacing dogs to be muzzled at all times. On Friday, the council sent letters out to 159 owners of dogs classified as menacing, saying that due to new legal advice, they would now have to keep their dogs muzzled at all times, even inside their own home. The council now seems to be doubting its own decision with the CEO saying they're seeking more legal advice about the new legal advice. But dog welfare groups say they should drop it altogether, whatever the advice. Rachel Graham has more. Abby Vanderplas, who set up Christchurch Bulldog Rescue, says the council's demand is cruel and stupid, and her group will fight the move in court if it has to. One of the biggest things in the Animal Welfare Act is that animals need to be able to display their natural behaviour. A dog's natural behaviour is to clean itself, is to, you know, drink water when it needs it, you know, dogs... A dog's nose and muzzle is its arms and legs. And if I was to tie your arms and legs behind your back and tell you to live a functioning life, you would have some questions for me. The head of the SBCA, Andrea Midgen, agrees that the move would breach the Animal Welfare Code and says they have contacted the council with their concerns. Ms Midgen says she also doesn't believe they will reduce dog bites by targeting specific breeds. It's also not great that they're targeting these um, menacing breed specific dogs. They're trying to reduce dog bites but this has been proven around the world that this doesn't actually necessarily happen by taking these sorts of actions. Dogs are classified as menacing if they have attacked or show an aggressive behaviour which the council says indicates they pose a threat to people or animals or if they are predominantly or wholly certain breeds including the Brazilian fila and the American pit bull. The Christchurch City Council has come to the decision after concerns about the number of serious attacks recently. It says since March last year, it has been called to 234 complaints about dog attacks. Those included attacks on people and other animals. But people spoken to out on the streets of Christchurch on a wet and windy day were split on the merits of the idea. It makes a lot of sense depending on the criteria that's set for what they call dangerous dogs. But I would think with humans, once something happens a second time, the chances are it's going to happen a third. I think the people aren't going to muzzle their dogs anyway. You know, people say you're not allowed to speed on open roads and people still speed, you know, so there's no point in putting muzzles on dogs. I don't think it's just, um, I think it's quite wrong. I definitely don't believe certain breeds because obviously it depends on the owner and what the dog's been through. Definitely 100%. But if obviously it's got a past and it's got a history, then obviously you've got evidence to wear a muzzle. Like, it's, it's common sense. No one from the council was available for an interview today, but a statement from its CEO says the last thing the council wants is someone or another animal to be hurt in a dog attack. In the statement, the chief executive, Carlene Edwards, said it had sought legal advice to ensure it was applying the Dog Control Act correctly and was informed that menacing dogs needed to be muzzled at all times, except if it is in a cage or in a vehicle. We acknowledge that this letter has come as a surprise because of the interpretation that is now being applied. We are urgently seeking further legal advice on this interpretation to ensure we are doing the right thing. Once we have this clarification, we will get in touch with all owners of dangerous and menacing dogs to help them understand what is required of them. The Dog Control Act has been around since 1996 and the SPCA says it's not aware of any other council which has interpreted the code in this way. In Christchurch for Checkpoint, Rachel Graham.
Let's go back to the Commonwealth Games. New Zealand's Julia Ratcliffe won gold in the women's hammer throw at the Games last night. The 24-year-old hopes her performance will inspire more young women to take up the sport, or in fact any sport. A silver medalist at the 2014 Glasgow Games, Ratcliffe recently graduated from Ivy League University Princeton in the US. What a remarkable young woman. She spoke to Joe Porter about training in cow paddocks, the trials and tribulations of being an unfunded athlete. David Litty was an unfunded athlete too. He won gold in the weightlifting. And just what it meant to win gold at the first Commonwealth Games where there's an equal number of men's and women's events. It's awesome. I, I think even uh, even better is seeing all the women's um, teams from African countries and where women's rights aren't necessarily as equal as they are in New Zealand. So it's awesome to see um, countries that don't have kind of equal representation having a lot more women's teams here. So that's been awesome to see them around the village. The IOC obviously have a big prerogative to try and get more w women involved in sport. How do you think they go about doing that? I think getting women involved in all levels, like in coaching, you kind of see quite a few male coaches, even of female teams, um, but just at all levels, and it's kind of, a lot of people use the excuse of, oh, we can't get people to apply, but you've really got to go out and seek them, so, um, yeah, just kind of encouraging females to get active from, from a young age and kind of involved in sport and just saying that, hey, like, it's... It's not, you're not being a princess, you're not being this, like you can go and be a strong athlete and that's a, like, a, a cool thing to do, that's a res like people will respect you for that and yeah, so just kind of changing, changing the image around female athletes and things like that. Is it harder for women, track and field athletes in particular, to forge a career than men? Is there more pathways available for the men than there are women? I think just in terms of coverage and things, um, yeah. I think in, in terms of sponsorships, mm -hmm. it kind of depends, like, it's, it's um, dictated by TV coverage and things like that, and so it's, I can't really speak, I'm not sponsored, nobody likes field events anyway, so, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think it, I think it's always a bit harder for women and things, but yeah. You're a great example, and you should hopefully inspire a lot of other women to participate and continue forward, and hopefully that momentum continues to roll on. Yeah, that would be the, honestly, that would be the ideal thing from this, because sometimes I feel as an athlete that it's a bit of a selfish thing to do, it's kind of like I just train in my backyard, and so if I can inspire young girls to get out there and be proud of their bodies and proud of what they do with them, that's, that's an awesome, that's a big win for me. A big win for Julia Ratcliffe, she's having lots of wins in life, extraordinary young New Zealander, uh, talking to Joe Porter, who's doing a fantastic job for us there at the Games. Uh, boy, they're a joy to deal with these Commonwealth Games athletes. Even the Silver Ferns today, who'd had an awful experience losing to England, wandered outside the stadium to talk to uh, NZ. Uh, lots of sports people, particularly some of the most famous ones, wouldn't do that when they lose. We appreciate the effort they're making to talk to us. That is Checkpoint for tonight. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back tomorrow at 5. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. The Attorney General says an inquiry is needed into an SAS-led raid in Afghanistan in 2010 so the public can have confidence in the Defence Force. The police and Crown Law are not commenting on fresh claims by the families of those who died in the CTV building collapse in 2011. The building minister is defending her ministry's failure to suspend certification of aluminium panel cladding on high-rise buildings. And hundreds of travellers remain stuck at Christchurch Airport after being diverted there after last night's storm closed Auckland's runway. Our next news and weather is at seven. Are we there yet? Is back with the new season. I don't know if a lot of people realise how crippling it can be. Anxiety can silence many children. He would this be an absolute fear just going to another class? And why we need to help our children confront negative feelings.